Okay, welcome. Our uh, podcast, our next podcast, uh, with uh, a very special guest, uh, Ezra Levin, who is one of the co-founders of the National Organization of Indivisible. Welcome, Ezra. Hey, great to be here. You know, we, we we've got a local guy here, Tim Lazuski, that I've been working with through the last election cycle, and I just uh, said, "Hey, Tim, can you get me one of the founders to come on our podcast?" And he said, "Sure." And like two weeks later, here you are. So I'm I am just like grateful. To have you on and and to have you as part of it. So just to give you a little bit of a background um, for our membership, we, we're our, we're an indivisible group here in the South Metro of the Twin Cities. Uh, we we started out calling ourselves the Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burnsville. Came out as a kind of a fancy IREB, uh, <laughs> to, uh, uh, yeah. And and so there's a there's a town south of us called Lakeville. And we've been making a play for them so that we can call ourselves IREBEL. <laughs> that's, that's 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 our group joke <laughs> yeah all right so um so uh, you know so we are an indivisible group we grew to about about 500 members down here we, we've been real active we you know we we've just been a um I, honestly i just want to say thank you for starting the organization it was the day after trump got elected it was got me, what got me up off the floor and working again you know and i've been working hard and it's really been a clear a uh, very uh, easy to follow path that you guys have laid out. And, and I wanted to kind of, you know, have you tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, a little bit about, you know, uh, where you come from so that the members can get to know you a little bit better. Well, great. No, I'm, I'm so happy to be on it. And, you know, I have some Minnesota roots. Uh, I went to school in uh, Carleton College, just a little bit south of where you all are. Um, yep. uh, really inspired to go there by Paul Wellstone, who was there before my time. Um, and was a professor there. And my, my wife, Leah Greenberg, who is also a co-founder of Indivisible, uh, um, uh, also was there uh, around the same time. Though, uh, oddly enough, we didn't meet each other there. We met each other in D.C. Um, so my, my background is, you know, right, uh, I'm from Texas originally. went to school in Minnesota in part because of Paul Wilson and in part because I wanted to see, to see snow for the first time, uh, which I did. Uh, and, and did you like it? Uh, you know, I think there are two types of snow, right? There's snow when it's about, you know, 25 uh, degrees or so, and it's light, and it's fluffy, and it's fun. And then there's snow when it's zero or negative 10, and it's just this hard rock. Uh, yeah. I'm going present. Um, so I, I guess I would say I like some types of snow, uh, yeah. is what I've come to appreciate. Um, uh, but after college, I, um, I was studying political science and economics at uh, Carleton, um, and got pretty deep into uh, anti-poverty advocacy and kind of wonky think tankiness. So I started out working on homelessness issues in the Bay Area after school. That was about 10, 11 years ago. Uh, left there and went to Capitol Hill and worked for a congressman from Austin, where I'm from, Austin, Texas, Lloyd Doggett, who's a progressive from the area. Yep. Um, I joined his office in Washington, D.C. the week that Lehman Brothers failed in September 2008. Uh, so it was uh, a momentous time. Uh, I, I started covering his social policy work um, in January of uh, 2009, right when Barack Obama took the presidency, and we had this supermajority about uh, to be in the Senate. So that gave me an unrealistically high expectation for what Congress could accomplish. Um, <laughs> this flurry of legislation, I was working, I mean, it was a very heady time. We were working on very interesting stuff, the stimulus, the healthcare bill, banking regulation, expansion of uh, service uh, work, um, a lot of interesting stuff. And um, then the Tea Party started showing up. Um, and I remember vividly the impact they had on what was politically possible, even before the election in 2010. Um, they were showing up at town halls. They were flooding the offices with calls. Although my member was not scared away from kind of bold stances, uh, many members were. Um, and it did actually have an impact, like a, 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 a palpable impact on what was happening in Washington, D.C. And I, that really had an effect on me. And, of course, after we lost, um, Democrats lost uh, the elections in, in 2010, the shellacking, as uh, Barack Obama called it, and it was a shellacking, um, the, that was the ball game. That was it. That was the end of major legislative accomplishment under President Obama. Um, and uh, so, you know, I left uh, Capitol Hill. I went to grad school to study public policy and poverty policy more. And then I spent the last four years or so before Trump's election working on more anti-poverty advocacy work, kind of working to you know, develop the policies and advocate for policies when we could get them done um, in, in kind of small ways. But, you know, the Trump administration, uh, the incoming Trump administration was a a uh, really tough time. And so Lee and I were both going through the stages of grief, trying to figure out what we could do after that election. And what we thought was, look, we, 
We can't do much uh, as former congressional staffers, but we can demystify how Congress works. That's what we can do. Um, and so that's why we wrote the Indivisible Guide. Yeah, and what a great start it was. I mean, it just, it really was. It was clear and concise. I read that book and, and it was like, it, 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 within a, a couple hours, I went from like totally desperate and despondent to actually having a plan. And, and so, um, you know, it, 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 and I wanted to talk about a little bit about that too, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the interesting uh, situation that we've got coming up because we're like the Tea Party, but we're not like them. And we're both going to be in the same space together now because they're going to probably come back to life, don't you think? So, you know, I kept on thinking that they were going to come back to life even last year. So we, we were worried early on in Indivisible's life that there would be these um, – these big conflicts between the Tea Partiers and the Indivisibles and other resistance groups in the streets. And, and frankly, that I don't know where they went. They have just evaporated. They tried to do a big uh, tax day event in Washington, D.C., and they, their crowd was in the dozens or something. It was, yeah. it was just absolutely pathetic. Um, and, you know, I think um, they're a little bit of victim of their own success. They think that they won. They got their president in. They took the House. They took the Senate. Um, and really the only major clashes between progressives and, and the Trumpians has been, you know, the, the Nazis in the street of Charlottesville and elsewhere versus everybody else. But even their numbers have been relatively small when combined. So, you know, frankly, I, I am not currently expecting a resurgence of the Tea Party, um, uh, not, not in the near term, not in the next two years. I actually think the next two years are an opportunity for Indivisible and the broader progressive movement at the grassroots to, to build up its power. I think the real question over the next two years is, what is the first bill going to be in January 2021? When we have the House, the Senate, and the presidency, what are we going to push through there? And the answer to that is what we settle over the next 18 months. What the Democratic House passes, what Democratic states pass as examples for what can be done at the federal level, and what the presidential contenders say they're going to uh, enact once they get into office. And none of this is set in stone yet. And nobody, I, I would say, nobody has more credibility than the indivisible groups on the ground and the folks who are part of building the blue wave to define what that should be. Well, that actually uh, leads into another area. Because so I, I'm, you know, I was on the the big call, and I'm I'm fired up for the January third. You know, getting getting out there, and we'll talk a bit about that in a second. But yeah. so it, here in CD two, Minnesota CD two, you know, uh, obviously we just flipped the seat, right? We we got rid of Jason Lewis, and we bring in an Angie Craig, and so we had that kind of interesting where we were we were, you know, uh, trying to highlight h how poorly we were being represented by Jason Lewis and now we've got this two-year term where we you know uh, I, I do we you know uh, where do we go with with this newly elected Democrat do we you know that's the kind of the question right now it's a different kind of a dynamic that we have yeah no it's a totally different dynamic and this is why you know in the in the months leading up to uh, uh, the election in 2018 we to be frank, we thought the election was going to go well. We were seeing, we were traveling around the country. We were meeting with indivisible groups. We saw the energy on the ground. We thought there was going to be a wave. We believed in it. And so we started writing this new guide, Indivisible on Offense, which is kind of Indivisible 2.0, um, which was explicitly about what do you do in the new Congress if, we, if Democrats control the House of Representatives? Because it is this totally new world. The original Indivisible Guide was written, and it was explicitly about defense. Going on offense is a huge opportunity. It's also much more complex. You've got and it, to, I would yeah. say, and it's a lot more fun. I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> it, it is so much more fun because it's more interesting. You can actually build towards the future you want to see and not just say no to the, the white supremacy and plutocracy that's being pushed by the Republicans. This, we get to fight for our values in proactive terms, which I think, I think it is really exciting. And uh, I would say you all are in a particular position, which is you've replaced your terrible member of Congress with this exciting new progressive member who should be going in and fighting for you. And let me say, the um, literally less than a, a week after the election, Indivisible um, was in Washington, D.C., our policy team, working with the Progressive Caucus of the U.S. House. And we held a training for incoming members of the Progressive Caucus. So about 15 members of the incoming U.S. House of Representatives, including folks like Andy Kim, Ocasio-Cortez, uh, 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 Lana Presley, um, and uh, including Angie Craig showed up. 
uh, at this training to be trained by the Progressive Caucus and Indivisible. And so we talked to them about what the resistance wants, how to set up a congressional office, what pressures you're going to face, how we can wield our power as, a, as progressives in the new Congress. And let me just say, Angie Craig was on fire in that meeting. I think you all have elected a great representative, and you should just make sure that she keeps standing up for you. The, yeah. the, job, the job of Indivisibles is not to elect a member of Congress. The job of Indivisibles is to ensure that your representatives represent you. And the great news is you have somebody who is inclined to do that now, and you just need to make sure that they do. Uh, actually, an interesting backstory on that. Angie uh, uh, texted me while she was at that event when she was sitting next to you. She said, oh, I'm sitting next to Ezra. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> said, oh, that's a great story. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're an exciting guy, Ezra. I mean, you've, you've, you know, I mean, I've been following you. I, I believe in, in, in Indivisible. It's been, you know, my, my waking every moment of my life since, you know, Trump got elected. And, and so one of the things that we do in our group, and it's kind of unique to us, is that when we get new members, we ask them, like, what was that moment that you stood up and you became active, that you, you, know, you went from whatever it is you're doing to become politically active? Now, I know you've been active for a long time, but do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like, where, 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 where was the, you know, I mean, before Trump, obviously, but, the, you know, when did you decide that, you know, you saw something that you wanted to change? And what was it? Yeah, no, I, I do remember it. I, um, I... This is well, well before Trump. I got active around the Iraq War, actually. Um, so I was, I was against the Iraq War during the Bush administration. My family is not, um, not part of the political community. My dad's a musician. My mom's a social worker. My uh, other, other, um, my, my siblings are um, uh, do music related things or other things. Um, so it's not, it's not part of my my background. But they were very uh, engaged in discussions around politics. So like I was, I was politically active in that sense, but I never actually, there is a difference between watching the news and discussing and actually taking action. And the very first action I took was around uh, uh, President Bush was running for reelection. I was shocked that anybody would vote for this guy again after he started uh, the Iraq war, after he massively cut taxes for corporations and rich people, like how on earth could, if anything, he's gonna lose votes and he lost the first election. Um, and uh, not having really any um, connection to the political world, I kind of looked around to see, well, what, what can I do? And I thought, well, my, you know, my dad's a musician in Austin. I know like all of our family friends are musicians. What I could do is why don't we put together a fundraiser for John Kerry and just have all of our musician friends play. Um, and, and then maybe some people will come out and give money and then we can give that to John Kerry. Uh, and so that's what I did. Um, I was a, a freshman in college. Uh, it was a summer break, and I, I put together this. Um, it was I think it was called Bash for Carry, uh, and <laughs> I made up made up little invitations. I, I went to a couple rallies and handed them out, and we got some you know locally noteworthy musicians to come and play. Um, and we raised you know a, a few thousand dollars for John Kerry. Um, and it felt it was my literally the very first time I had had any kind of political activism, and I. Um, I know that that's somewhat of a unique story, but actually I've heard stories like that all across the Indivisible movement, which is people looking around saying, well, what, what social networks do I have? What skills do I have? And how can I use that in this moment? And I do think that is, that is the magic of Indivisible is it's, it's really not command and control. We don't have a cookie cutter platform for this is exactly what you have to do. What we have is uh, a platform for civic engagement. And what you do with that civic engagement is based on what skills you have, what experience you have, what social networks you have, but that's what makes it work. Um, and uh, so, you know, what we're dedica dedicated to going forward is having as many people going forward have that same realization that this isn't rocket science. You don't have to be a politico to do this. You don't have to be an expert in policy to do this. Your legitimacy comes from the fact that you are a constituent in the United States of America. That's it. That's all that's required. Um, everybody has something to bring to this. And, um, you know, I happen to have some musician friends. Other people happen to be computer programmers. Other people happen to be able to start podcasts. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's great. I'm I'm totally on board with you there too because that's you know what been it's been our our focus in our group too. You know, finding ways because not everybody wants to knock a door, not everybody wants to hand out a piece of lit. You know, and those things are fine. They, they work. You know, and tried and true. But there was other things, and we saw it. I, I actually, you know, because we we did so well here in CD two, and I want to brag for a minute. We flipped. Um, uh, you know, not only our our congressional seat, but uh, of the we we what we have is we've got eighteen uh, state house seats 
seats that live in this congressional district, right? And um, of that, we've never historically had more than five that were Democrats. So for throughout history, it's it's always been a predominantly Republican. You know, we've sent predominantly Republicans to our state house. This last election cycle, we flipped seven. We actually held one, flipped seven. We we're sitting at eleven of the eight. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know that anybody else in America did to that extent. And we actually did focus on our state house races in addition. So that's what I'm kind of, um, you know, interested in about 2.0, um, you know, heading in that direction. And, and I wanted to kind of talk about that, um, um, you know, but first I wanted to ask you that because you were talking about you know, like indivisible, that shim that we've become to, to take ordinary people from – just caring about something and then making them effective activists in, you know, generally it's, they're going to end up in the democratic party because that's who we caucus with mostly. But I, I have, we become something, I mean, you know, you know, cause I, people keep like, are we going to like have elections? Are we going to become something? You know, there's a lot of organizations that they wanted to like replace the party. You know, who, are, what are we? What are we? Uh, you know, uh, you know, I think it's worth just, uh, pausing and reflecting on the story that I just told about the the progressive caucus training, you know, two years ago we were fretting after Donald Trump's election in an incredibly dark place, scared of what was to come, feeling alone, literally in our living room, just writing down thoughts on what might be possible. And two years later, we were in the halls of Congress with the incoming House majority, the progressive caucus of that majority, training them on what was to come when they retake the House of Representatives and can finally start holding the Trump administration accountable. The, the amount of power that the indivisible movement has built over the last two years is astonishing. And historic, not even just in terms of the Tea Party, but historic in broader American terms. So there's a there's a historian, there's a sociologist and historian um, over at Harvard called Theta Scotchpole, who does um, work on the history of American civic engagement. Um, she wrote one of the definitive books on the Tea Party um, uh, back in about 2010, 2011, with a woman named Vanessa Williamson, who's a Brookings uh, Institute scholar. Um, she went to communities on the Eastern Seaboard to interview the people who were part of these Tea Party groups and talk about what made them tick, how they operated, how they were building power. She is now going back to those same communities or similar communities on the Eastern Seaboard and meeting with the indivisible groups and resistance groups in those communities to learn about them. And you said this earlier, there are a lot of similarities, but there are differences. Um, indivisible is not command and control in any way. We're not gonna have a few billionaires come in and tell everybody what to do and try to control this. At the very heart, the thing that is going to make this real, the thing that is going to allow it to continue to exist and build power is the fact that it is locally driven, um, the fact that it is owned by the locals. But it is always going to be a balance between to what extent is this fully locally driven and how much are we coordinating? Because those two things can be in conflict. We need to be able to coordinate at the local, state, and federal level in order for there to be impact. So one of the things I'm really, really excited for in 2019, because this is an off year, this isn't an election year, this can be a year that we invest in coordination and network development for the movement as a whole. Because what we're headed towards in 2020 is a really uncertain time. There is nothing guaranteed about Trump going down. There is nothing guaranteed about us maintaining control of the House of Representatives. There's nothing guaranteed that we'll be happy with what comes out of the presidential process. And I think Indivisible should absolutely play a role in who becomes the next Democratic nominee for president. I also know that that cannot happen because I choose or Leah chooses or National says, this is the candidate, let's all get behind him. The process has to be uh, fundamentally driven at the local level. And so I think 2019 is a time for us to talk about what does that process look like? How can we think about selecting who we want to be the national leader of the Democratic Party? What direction do we want the movement to go in terms of coordination between local groups, coordination within a state, coordination between the state and the federal priorities? Um, the movement needs to keep becoming more sophisticated if we're going to build our power and then wield our power. I will say, we, I started with the story about the progressive caucus training because, again, we shouldn't lose sight of just how incredibly impressive this movement has been over two years. Um, being on the forefront of progressive change, both at the local level and the federal level, in such a short time, it's just, I mean, we should, 
I hope everybody is taking this holiday break and celebrating a little bit because people should be really, really proud. Um, and the, the opportunity in front of us now is do we harness that and build on it? How do we avoid letting it dissipate? And you, you talked about the January 3rd National Day of Action. I think that's, that's absolutely key. We need to send a message to all of Congress, even our friends, even Angie Craig. Hey, we are so excited you're there. We're here to stay. Remember us, we're still here um, and we're gonna stay engaged. Yeah, so let's talk about a little bit about the January 3rd event. What we're working on is um, um, we're actually trying to gather up the the, uh, the indivisible groups through, uh, through in, at least in the metro area, the ones that can participate. And we're going to have an event on uh, the steps of our state capitol on January 3rd. Um, we've invited our governor, our governor-elect, as the keynote speaker, um, you know, I, we'll, we'll hopefully uh, get something back. But you know, this is this is <clears throat> excuse me, this is uh, exciting, exciting stuff. I was uh, I was in, in on the uh, the the call. Uh, you were on your way to Rachel's show, uh, and when when you when you stopped in, um, and and so talk a little bit about that. You know, give us a little bit of that fire. I mean, I, I think you know we were, we kind of mentioned a little bit about being on the offense, having some control, establishing an agenda. You know, that kind of thing. No, I think uh, one thing I want to point out, because I don't think this is so obvious, and a lot of the political system actually does not recognize this. I, I think indivisibles get it, but it's not fully recognized. Some people think there is the elections world, and then there's the advocacy world, and they're two different worlds. But it's just not the case. It is a continuum. The reason why we were so successful in the 2018 elections is because the, the people like, like the folks in Indivisible Minnesota Second, the uh, Minnesota Second groups, the, you look like groups all over the country. You started organizing in 2017 to fight against the Trump care bill or to fight against the bad tax bill or to fight against other things that Trump was doing. And that, that had a few effects. One, it helped establish your legitimacy and actually build up your group. People knew there was something they could be part of. Two, it scared the other side. It actually scared the other side. And I know this didn't happen all over the state or all over the country, but we had this wave of retirements on the Republican side because they saw this buildup of constituent power and they thought, well, I don't want to face that. (laughs) And retired in the face of that. Three, and I I think this is incredibly key, and there's there's academic research to support this. You even for people who are not directly part of Indivisible, because you were making news, you were affecting what people thought of your elected representative. So when you were advocating against a bad Republican who is not listening to you, other people were reading that news. People who thought that maybe oh they thought this was one of the reasonable Republicans, and they were actually on our side, and then they learned that that wasn't the case. So the work that you're doing in in off years is absolutely crucial for building waves in election year. Um, so I, I think uh, the, the real importance of this January 3rd event is we need to start off the 116th Congress right. We need to do that for our friends. So Angie Craig needs to know that you are there and you have her back and you want her to be fighting for you. Um, she needs to also know that if for whatever reason she votes the wrong way you're going to be there too and you're going to say hey angie why are you doing that we got you into office we want you to vote the right way and also you need to do that to scare away any potential challengers she might have people that might think oh that was just a 2018 thing but in 2020 when trump is running for re-election i'm going to challenge her again and i'm going to be able to beat her um if you demonstrate your strength early on that's going to give potential competitors uh, uh a reason to think twice about how hard they're going to actually fight to get into that race. And that's going to make it easier for her to win a general election in 2020. So I just would urge people uh, to to not think of this as, you know, either we do advocacy or we do elections work. It's all part of the same thing. And uh, there's a lot to look forward to on the advocacy side. I think um, one of the challenges that Indivisible is going to face going forward is, um, we were incredibly effective, and by we, I mean the indivisible movement as a whole, incredibly effective at getting earned media because we were doing very interesting new things. We were demonstrating that we disagreed with our members or representatives. There was conflict. There were constituents who were organizing. They were uh, in different places. They were holding empty chair town halls or they were bringing live chickens on stage to represent a Republican <laughs> They were kayaking out to a fundraiser. Um, the, there are a whole bunch of examples of this. Um, in order for a movement like Indivisible to continue growing, you need to keep on getting attention. And the attention establishes your legitimacy, and it also helps you recruit. The way to keep on getting attention is to keep on being interesting. So you're going to have to keep innovating tactics. You're going to have to keep on thinking about how to 
generate interesting events that people want to be part of, that the media wants to cover. That's how you build your power and apply your power. So the same exact things that we've been doing for the last two years can't be what we do in 2019. We've got to figure out new stuff to do. Wow, that's great. I, I, I'm, I'm, that's just fiery stuff. I can't wait to get going. I love listening to you. You're a great speaker. No wonder you're good at this. So we're getting close to the end of the, sh the show, but I wanted to cover like no day goes by in Trump's America without like multiple headlines. All right. So um, we had some stuff that came out today. Looks like um, um, they're, they're, they're showing some, some weakness on, you know, they're going to back down on the five bill for the wall um, and, and looks like uh, um, maybe no government shutdown. You got any comments about any of that? I am so, so excited about this. Look, I, I knew that if we took the House of Representatives, 2019 was going to look completely different. I would not have told you we were already going to be racking up the wins. And I just want to underline this. This was far from a guaranteed thing. So to be clear, the headline here is we won. The headline here is we won. And we won in a huge way on two fronts. One, Trump was asking for $5 billion to build his in incredibly stupid wall. Um, and he was threatening to shut down the government if he didn't get that. But it's even more than that. He's not just not getting $5 billion. There was a previous deal struck by the Democratic minority leader and the Republican majority leader in the Senate to provide $1.6 billion for border security and fences and other things. That was before the election. Immediately after the election, there were some rumblings that they might stick to that deal, but that's not what happened. Instead, what happened is through the result of direct pressure from indivisible groups and others, uh, the Democratic Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and the incoming Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, went into the Oval Office together and said, too bad, Trump, you lost the election. We're going to give you nothing. You get, you get flat funding. That's what, that's what the offer is right now. That was not a given. That's what they offered. And the newest report that we've had so far tonight uh, or th this afternoon is they've won that what we are getting is flat funding that'll take us into February of next year. Trump gets no additional new funding for his wall. He gets nothing at all. He got nothing. And that's exactly what should happen, to be clear. Democrats won the election. Elections have consequences. Um, but uh, just to be clear, the reason why this was possible is because we stayed engaged after the election. We didn't say we won, you all can do whatever you want. The day after the election, when this fight was coming up, Indivisible stayed engaged and said, hey, why are we giving this guy anything? He just was, he lost the midterms election by a greater, uh, a, a greater number than literally in the history of the republic. <laughs> we shouldn't give him anything. And the Democrats went in without leverage and they won. So I, I am, uh, I, I got to say, I'm just so excited by this win. I'm excited for what it uh, portends for 2019. Um, I don't think this means a switch is flipped. I don't think this means the fight's over, but it does mean that what we have demonstrated, we just got a bunch of leverage. And when we use that leverage, we prevent racist, xenophobic walls from being built. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that, that's the thing. I mean, we, we were able to uh, make, uh, you know, this, uh, establish that along the way in the last two years, we, we stopped so much crap and we, we you know, our al -Qaeda. And now we're actually able to set agenda and get things done. This is so, such an exciting time to be an activist. And, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for the, the chance to, to be part of this organization and, and uh, to have met you, Ezra. Thank you for coming on the show. If you got any closing comments for us, we're, we're just about out of time. Well, I'm, I'm just so excited about being in this movement with y'all. Look, we wrote a typo-filled Google Doc a couple of years ago, which is all well and good. Um, the only thing that is making this real are people all over the country who are actually doing the work to build the movement. None of this happens. Absolutely none of this happens just because some folks in D.C. or some centrally located organization tries to make it happen. The only reason why it works is because there are thousands of groups all across the country doing it. So our role at Indivisible is to serve the leaders of this movement. This is why we exist. We have policy goals. We have political goals. We want to accomplish big things. The theory about how we get there is by having powerful community level progressive infrastructure in every single community. So uh, let Indivisible know how we can help. Happy to come on the podcast again after our next big win. Um, and happy to keep on talking. I'm excited for what y'all are building in Minnesota. All right. Well, thank you, Ezra. Thank you for everyone uh, listening. And, and that's the end of our, our podcast.